Good morning. We are very glad to have you all here with us this morning. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary, those of you who are joining us online or who will see us later, we are glad uh, that you are here with us. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, do want to let you know that Vacation Bible School is going on this week, Monday through Thursday evening. Uh, there's details in your bulletin. There is still time to sign uh, children up, including, although we'd prefer not, but including on Monday morning. So uh, plenty of opportunity there. I uh, do want to update you that the swim night that was supposed to take place tonight has been canceled for obvious reasons. So uh, we are going to miss that. And then also we have a music camp coming up at the end of uh, this month, beginning of next month, uh, Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, there for a couple weeks. There's details there in your bulletin, including which kids, which days, what times, and information on how to sign kids up for that. And we're looking forward to that too, another kind of normal thing that we're, we're getting back to. So uh, we appreciate that. And... Uh, with that, I'll invite you to stand and join me in the opening prayer, if you would please. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and live according to it, that we may grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. stars in their courses, and sun in its orbit, obediently shine. The hills and the mountains, the rivers and fountains, the deeps of the ocean, proclaim the divine. We too should be voicing With glad adoration, a song let us raise, till all things now living unite in thanksgiving to God in the highest. Hosanna and praise. You may be seated. Boys, you want to come up? Right. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. All right. So let me ask you. You guys are looking sharp today. I've got to say that. All right. So um, 
How many, have you ever watched golf on TV? You watch golf on TV? You have? Okay, maybe by accident? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so you know, um, you know how they clap at a golf tournament? Do you know the golf clap? You know the golf clap? How's the golf clap go? It's kind of like this, real quiet, real quiet golf clap. Can you golf clap? Can you just golf clap? All right. How about, every, how about everybody? Can you just golf clap? Give us a golf clap out there. Okay. So, have you watched a football game? Now we're talking, right? Now we're talking a football game. Have you ever seen the wave? Football game? You ever done the wave at a, at a ball game? You've never done? You've never done the wave? Well, you're in luck today. Awesome. So, you know, the wave, what happens is everybody stands up, you raise your hands up, you go, yay, right? And it goes around the room, right? So you start it, and then somebody starts, and then you go around the room. So um, we're going to do the wave. we do the wave here today. So we're going to start, right? And then it's going to go over there to that section. It's going to come across like that over to that section, and then back to us, and we'll, we'll be last, okay? We'll be last again. So we can do it twice. Okay, are you ready? We'll do the wave. Got to stand up. And, well, you stand up when you do it, so follow me. Okay, so ready? Everybody ready? Everybody ready out there? One, two, three. Yay! Over here, across here, over there. Yay! All right. <laughs> They're going to keep going. All right, we're going to do the wave. All right. Hey, so that was, that was fun. So, is that the first time anybody's ever done the wave in church? If you've never done the wave in church before, raise your hand. Okay, awesome outside the box, right? So, do you think church is more like, do you think praising God in church, does it feel more like a golf clap or does it feel more like doing the wave? Kind of maybe, what? sometimes more like a golf clap, huh? Maybe sometimes in the middle. Do you think God loves both those things? I think he does too. And so today's story is about David, like we've been talking about David for a while now. But David, one day, he was was worshiping God, and he was so into worshiping God that he was dancing around, and his wife didn't like it. His wife thought that a king should not be behaving that way, right? The king should be. He was kind of acting like a fool, really. But he was acting like a fool for God, so it was all good. Um, but his wife thought, gosh, a king shouldn't be acting like that. That's not very dignified for a king to act like that. But David said, you know what? I was worshiping God, and I don't care what other people think. I'm just, I'm worshiping God with all, with all of my might, and I'm just letting loose. And so sometimes we need to do that too. Sometimes we need to do more, more wave than golf clap, huh? All right, let's pray. Dear God... Help us to worship you with all of our heart, to forget about ourself and what other people think, and focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.
I wanted to let them get through their duet before I brought this up. But um, this is Josh and Kristen's last Sunday with us. Um, They're moving on to Quincy, Illinois, uh, pursuing work there. But um, you've been a blessing to our church, to our music program, both this service, 8 o'clock, including coming in and joining us in the crazy pandemic, pre-recorded worship extravaganza that we did every week. And so uh, we appreciate your, your ministry among us and and my prayer for you is the song that you just sang, that you would go, go forth and, and be in ministry in your new place and continue to use your gifts to glorify God to serve His church. And so let's thank them for their... Thank you. Thank you. And now with joy and thanksgiving, let us offer our gifts to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we give thanks to you for all the gifts that you have given to us. And in praise and thanksgiving, we offer you our gifts in return. Bless the givers and the gifts and those who have not to give. Use our gifts and us to do your work in the world, to spread your gospel throughout the earth, and to bring glory to your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. may be seated. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound, Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound, Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound, Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. When I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. Listen to the word of God. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bela in Judah to bring from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ohio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord. With castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. Excuse me. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls and of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would do. 
David said to Michal, It was because the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are continuing our series, David, a man after God's own heart. David has been made king of Israel and has set up his capital in Jerusalem. And so David wants to make Jerusalem not only the political capital of Jerusalem, but also the religious capital, or not only the political capital of Israel, but the religious capital of Israel as well. And so David decides that it's time to move the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Now I need to catch you up. The Ark of the Covenant, if you do not know, was a basically a a gold-plated wooden box with a cover, and on the cover there were angels on the cover, and inside the box were kept the original tablets of the Ten Commandments, an artifact that's now lost to history. It was the most sacred object in all of Israel. It was the, the symbol of God's presence and of God's covenant with the people. And it was holy, right? Only, only the priests could even see it. And when it needed to be moved, the priests went in and covered it. And then the Levites, and only the Levites, and only a particular tribe of the uh, clan of the Levites, would go in and carry it with poles on their shoulders. Nobody looked at, nobody touched the ark itself. That gets to be important here in a moment. It was sacred. It was holy. It was powerful. If we fast forward into the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel, when Samuel the prophet, so this is before David, before Saul, Samuel the prophet is still a young man. And the ark, this is 1 Samuel chapter 4, the ark was captured by the Philistines. Remember the Philistines? Um, And they captured it, they took it to one town, and a plague broke out. So they moved it to another town, and a plague broke out. And they moved it to another town, and a plague broke out. And finally decided, maybe we should send this thing back where it came from. Because that's what you should always do when there's a plague. You should, whatever, whatever's causing the plague, you should move it to the next town. Right? Um, but finally the Philistines return it in 1 Samuel chapter 7. It ends up in, the, it ends up in a town um, uh, of kirith Jiriam. Uh, in the home of a man named Abinadab that's about nine miles west of Jerusalem. And it stays there for about 20 years. So finally David decides to move it to Jerusalem, again to bring the religious capital to Jerusalem. David organizes a parade. He puts the ark on a cart. Now this, of course, as I told you before, is not the correct way to move the ark. And because David did not do his research, it cost Uzzah his life. Now, we need to unpack this a little bit because this doesn't make a lot of sense to our modern mind. Uh, But this is under uh, that great... um, what I call the old, one of the, one of the keys I give people for understanding the Old Testament is what the Old Testament is trying to tell us. Or how many of you have read something really weird in the Old Testament? Right? I, I read something really weird in the Old Testament. This is one of those things. Um, what the Old Testament is trying to tell us is um, God is holy. God is holy and you are not and, and the way God is going to enforce His holiness, the kind of requirements that He is going to place upon His people simply will not make sense to you because He is holy, you are not. That's the constant thing that 
God is trying to make the Israel under, Israelites understand, and then us by extension, is that He is holy, He is different, He is special, He is set apart, we are not. And this is one of those things. You don't touch the ark because God is holy, you are not. Uh, another pastor uh, uh, that I listen to, uh, Shane Bishop, as he guides his people through the Old Testament, as a matter of fact, they've got an Old Testament reading plan in his church. And he says one of the things that, that he gives them is um, just, uh, he calls them cards. They're not physical cards, but like, you know, how you're, you're playing and you just lay down a card and that kind of ends the conversation because that's Trump. Well, one of the Trump cards he gives them is called, that's what it says, move on. So sometimes in the Old Testament, you got to be, that's what it says, move on. So that's us a story. Uh, but another pastor that I have listened to, and see, sermon plagiarism is, is really a big deal right now. That's why I'm making sure I'm telling you that I'm getting this from other places. Um, uh, Paul Washer said the, the mistake that Uzza made, the mistake that Uzza made is that he didn't realize that in the, he thought that the ark was going to hit the ground and that would be a terrible thing. The mistake Uzza made is that he didn't realize that in God's eyes, his hand was dirtier than the ground. God's holy. We are not. And he also didn't realize that God, that God didn't need Uzza to save him. God didn't need Uzza to rescue him. Do not touch the ark of God. But who's ultimately responsible for Uzzah's death? I want to suggest to you it's David. All right, we've, we know that David wasn't perfect. We're going to see that in a big way in a couple weeks. But, but maybe we could point to this as the, one, of, one of David's many mistakes is that David did not do his homework. David should have consulted with the Levites. David should have consulted with the priests before he put this ark on a cart and subjected it to the possibility of falling. So because David didn't do his homework, Uzzah died. That's when, when you're a leader, when you're a leader and you mess up, sometimes other people get hurt. That's part of leadership. But I also want to suggest to you that the, 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 mistake, the big mistake they made here is, you know, they didn't tie the, they didn't tie the ark down, Right? And, and, you know, the good Midwestern style, they should have got some twine, right? And, and tied it down. And, and the most important part, you Midwest dads out there, the most important part of tying something down is the prayer. You guys know the prayer? What you do is you make that last knot, you cinch it real tight, you wiggle the, you wiggle the twine, you say, yeah, that's not going anywhere. You got to say that. That's not going anywhere. If you say that, you're good. So they must not have said the, the prayer when they put the ark on a cart. Well, of course, this, this like blows David's mind, right? He just got somebody killed. Um, he's angry, read as in angry with himself. Um, he's afraid for good cause. And so he stows the ark at yet somebody else's house, Obed-Edom, and... Uh, and leaves it there until finally he hears that there's blessing attached to the ark. Yes, it's holy. Yes, you've got to be careful with it. Yes, there's a right way and a wrong way to go about handling it. But done the right way, there's great blessing there. And so when David finds out that there's blessing there, he says, i got to try this again. And so later, David moves the ark again. But this time, notice, he does it right. Notice they're carrying it. They got the poles out. They got the Levites out. They got the, they got the worship going on. They made the sacrifices. We're going to do it right this time. So he learned his lesson. There's a right way and a wrong way to do things, especially in Old Testament worship. Because again, God's trying to tell you that he's holy. That you, you can't just worship him, especially in the Old Testament, any old way. Because he's holy. By the way, there's a reason why the Old Testament goes to such great lengths to, to cement in our minds the fact that God is holy. Because it's only with a holy God that the gospel makes sense. Right? The gospel is good news. 
What's the good news? The good news is that the holy, sovereign God of the universe loves you and wants to forgive you. See, now, if, if, if God were just cuddly sky grandpa, right? Cuddly sky grandpa, that's, a lot of, that's what a lot of people have an image of God as kind of cuddly sky grandpa. But the fact that cuddly sky grandpa loves you and, and wants to forgive you that's not news. That's not news. Of course he does. But the holy, sovereign God of the universe loving you and forgiving you, that's good news. That's why we must cement that in our brains. So as the ark is being moved, David is dancing, we're told, before the Lord with all of his might. He's just worshiping. And he don't care who's watching, right? Um, and he is just after it. Of course, this upsets David's wife, Saul's daughter, Michal, or Michael. Um, and uh, she becomes indignant. She despises him. And she says... She says, basically, you're dancing around half naked. Now, let me unpack that because he's wearing an ephod, which I want you to think of like a smock, kind of hole in the middle, front, back, tied together with a, with a rope, come down to about here, right? Um, this, was, this was ancient underwear, right? And so, um, now, there's some people who would, who, some Bible scholars say that the way this is phrased would, would suggest that David experienced what we might call today a wardrobe malfunction in this process. And so that's why Mikhail is upset. Uh, but it could just be the fact that she thinks that the way he's dressed is, is beneath his dignity and the way he's behaving is beneath his dignity as a king. Um, I mean, wardrobe malfunction or not, he's out there in his Old Testament tidy whities in his B.C. BVDs. So, his wife is upset. Right? Go figure. You guys, you go out dancing in your underwear, you're going to hear something. Right? Just, just to tell you. But see, David didn't care. David didn't care. David replied that he was willing to be even more undignified in order to bring more glory to God. That's the money verse in this scripture. That David is willing to set his own dignity aside. David doesn't care what other people think. He is going to worship God with reckless abandon. Because God is worthy of that. God, he, God, David is going to be more concerned about God's dignity than his own dignity. It was this verse that John Wesley referred to, quoting the King James Version, of course, when he decided to begin field preaching, when he said, I consented to be more vile. So John Wesley, most of you know, was an Anglican priest. Uh, I like John Wesley a lot. John Wesley did some great innovative things later in his life for the church and launched the movement that we're all a part of. Uh, but if you had met a young John Wesley, you would not have liked him. John Wesley was a snob. He was self-described worship bigot or uh, 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 religious bigot. That's how he described himself. He said, I would have thought it was a sin to save somebody's soul outside of a church. You wouldn't have liked him. I mean, I've read a lot of his early stuff. I don't like him. I like his later stuff, but... Um, so he had a friend, George Whitfield, who was also a preacher who had started uh, field preaching in Bristol, in the Bristol region of England, outside the coal mines, preaching to people that would never go to church, never be welcomed in church. And he's having this great response, and George goes to John, said, John, you've got to give this a try. John's like, I don't know, I don't want to do that. That seems a bit too, you know, ugh, um, you know. But finally... Finally, John decides that it's not, God, it's not God's dignity, it's not God's honor that he's trying to protect by avoiding field preaching. He decides that it's his own. 
And so John decides to set his own dignity, his own honor, his own comfort, his own ego, his own snobbery and bigotry aside and begin preaching in the fields. And that, along with his organization of the class meetings, was what became the Methodist movement, which is why we are here today. So how can we apply all this to our lives? Right? Do, do, you, feel, do you feel the tension between these two scenes in this chapter? Do you feel the tension between these two scenes? You got, you got poor Uzza, right? He's just trying to catch the ark. He's dead, right? What's, versus David dancing in his underwear. And there's that tension there. And you should feel that tension because it's there. And it's there because it's trying to pull us in a direction. And here's what I think the direction is. A couple of points. First and foremost, we remember that God is holy. God is holy. God is different from us. God is not going to make... what Who God is, what God wants, what God says, isn't always going to make sense to us because He is holy, we are not. And because God is holy, he is worth worshiping. That's what the word worship means to ascribe worth to something. When we worship God, we're telling him that he's worth our worship. Um, And of course, as my dad's always said, anything worth doing is worth doing right, right? Um, So worship is worth doing. Greater the lost ark, right? Um, you think the Bible was bad, right? That was, uh, worship is worth doing carefully, and it's worth doing well. It's worth doing carefully, right? Uzza, ask Uzzah, he'll tell you all about being careful. Um, and it's worth doing well. Now, I think well is a relative term. Um, it depends on where the church finds itself and the kind of resources and talent it has available to it. Um, we are blessed here at Wesley all the way around with the resources we have available for worship and the kind of talent that we have in our worship leadership. Uh, We're losing some of that, unfortunately. But we are blessed. Somebody say amen. Amen. We are blessed here at work because we can do worship really well. And, but, I'll say more about that in a minute, but that's relative, Right? But it's just, it's the best you can do. It's the best you can do with what you have at the time. That's what God wants from us. And there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Right? It shouldn't be done carelessly. It should be done joyfully, but not carelessly. Second, we seek to glorify God and not ourselves. We seek to glorify God and not ourselves. See, let us stop trying to be respectable to people let us stop trying to be dignified or or whatever or respectable on one hand or being relevant or cool to people on the other rather than being respectable or relevant let us just worry about being reverent to God you see here's the thing church is weird church is weird Right? You all got up on Sunday morning. You all got up on Sunday morning in the rain. You came in here. You sat down. You're going to listen to some guy talk to you. Right? And, and, then, and then, you know, if we have a baby, you know, what do we do? We bring him up here and throw water on him. It's weird. It's weird. And then first Sunday of the month, we, we get these little, and, and it used to be, you know, we used to eat a loaf of bread. And like, but now, COVID, we get this little bitty cup of stuff. And, and we say it's the body and blood of Christ. That's weird. It's weird. Church is weird. Worship is weird. It's a weird thing to do. Now, our, our temptation, friends, is to try to de-weird it. Right? And I'm not even talking about music style now. I'm talking about we try to make the place comfortable, inviting, welcoming. Um, you know, air conditioning is better than not air conditioning. And padded pews are better than not padded pews. And uh, But... but but let's not try. Let's keep it weird. 
Let's keep it weird and stop apologizing for it. Stop trying to de-weird it. Let's embrace the weird. Because worship's weird. Um, Jackie, uh, um, Francis Chan, who's a pastor out in California, now a missionary in Asia, written a lot of books, done a lot of videos, um, tells a story about uh, a, a woman who came to him after worship service one Sunday, and, and she said, I didn't like the worship service today. And uh, Pastor Chan responds, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. We're, we're, we're not here to be entertained, friends. If, if you want to be entertained, I'll make a recommendation. MPW's got 500 channels, right? Lots of entertainment there, better than what you're going to get here. You don't have to leave the house. But it's not about us. Third, while worship looks different in different times and different places, worship is always evolving. Worship is always evolving. Liturgy is always evolving. Music always is always evolving. The technology we use in worship is always evolving. But while worship looks different in different places and different times, it is never just about our personalities and preferences. It is not about what we think or what we enjoy. We need to get off that train. Fourth and finally, we sometimes need to just simply forget about ourselves and praise God with all of our might. I said earlier that I, I, we're, 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 we're blessed here at Wesley. I, I say this in many ways, in many different forms, to many different people around this church in the three years that I've been here. But I do not think that there's a church of our size anywhere, certainly in the Iowa Annual Conference, but I don't think anywhere there's a church of our size that is doing both contemporary and traditional worship with the kind of quality that we're doing it here at Wesley. I, I firmly believe that. I won't argue with other pastors about it because I won't win that argument, but I'm going to tell you that I think it's true. And so that is to say, I think we're kind of spoiled here at Wesley. Somebody say amen. We're spoiled. We're spoiled. We, we become accustomed to a certain um, level of quality. And that came home to me here recently. I was at a meeting at another church, and, and uh, they were opening us with worship. And, and it was a little church, and um, it was bad. I mean, it was, it was bad. Anybody ever been to just, it's, it's bad. Regardless of the style of music, it just, they weren't, yeah, it was bad. Anybody been bad? All right. It was bad. But, but the people who were leading it were leading it with all their heart. And they were leading it with the best of their ability. And they were having, they were enjoying what they were doing and they were offering it to God. And I got convicted because I was basically being a worship snob. And the world does not need more worship snobs. The world does not need more worship snobs. That's not a, that's not a currently filling position within the body of Christ. Now, now, trust me, I can be a worship snob. And I don't even, I don't even it's not even so much about music. A lot of people are about the music. I, I, you know, I, like, I, I tell people I like music fine. Matter of fact, I like both kinds, country and western. But... I get more snobby about like liturgy and sacraments and stuff like that. And trust me, I can bore you to tears. Don't get me started. But we need to lay that worship snobbery aside. And while we need to worship well, we also need to worship joyfully. While we need to worship carefully, we also need to worship exuberantly. We need to be less concerned about our ego and our pleasure and our preferences and our glory and our dignity and more worried about God's dignity. And so I ask you today, however you worship, are you willing to be undignified? Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to worship.
God, we, we do not deserve to be here. We do not deserve to come here. We do not deserve to, to assemble in your presence. But yet, through the blood of Jesus Christ, you make us worthy. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you call us together into your presence to worship you. And so, God, we pray that you'd wor- we'd worship you well. We'd worship you with all the talents and gifts and abilities that you've given us. That we'd worship you with all of our heart and with all of our might. And that we would care about your pleasure. And not what others might think about us. God, we pray for our church. We pray that you'd bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for all of your faithful people in every nation and denomination. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church, for this annual conference and our Bishop Lori, this district, and our Superintendent Doug. We pray for our community, our nation, and our world in these troubled times. We pray for all the people and places who are in need throughout the world. We pray for every person who is sick or suffering or struggling. We pray for men and women who serve us at home and abroad, for our military and for our veterans, for our law enforcement and our first responders, for our health care workers and all the essential workers that serve our community. We pray for our world leaders at every level. We pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world, the blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And now, O God, we pray that you'd hear the prayers of each and every heart that is worshiping with us today, wherever they are, as we lift up our prayers to you, either silently or aloud, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Loving God, you've heard our prayers here this morning and you hear the prayers that remain silent upon our hearts. God, you know our every need and when we do not know how to pray, your spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you'd hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now would you please stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I turn 
danced in the morning when the world was begun, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun, and I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth. At Bethlehem I had my birth. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they would not dance and they would not follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. They came to me and the dance went on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath when I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped me and hung me high, and they left me there on a cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday and the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance, and I still go on. Dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down and I leapt up high. I am the life that will never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ, experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen. Amen.